Oh. Hi. How's it going? How are you? I'm good. I'm having some. I'm gonna move it's nice to see you. Things. Some coffee, yeah. Did, did you notice, like, um, like, I did this today. Remember when we first tried? <laughs> we, tried <laughs> we tried like 14 times or four, <laughs> but we got there. Hey, look, now you're a pro. <laughs> I am a pro. So, um, hi, everybody out there. So, I'm Jane Golden, and this is <laughs> Instagram Live, one o'clock, Wednesdays. Yay. And we have the one and only Conrad Better today, who I love and respect. One of my favorite people in the city, Streets Department. Gotta go to that site, everyone, because it's just awesome. So, Conrad, oh, the world is a mess. Oh, yeah. But first, I want to start. How are you? I'm Mark? good. I got a lot of sleep last night. I'm working on some fun projects, one or two with you, which I'm excited about. Um, yeah. And it's a beautiful day. You know, I'm trying to take, you know, joy in the small things, if you will. Um, and it's a beautiful day. Yes, you're right. I think that is really important, taking joy in the small things. And also, I think that uh, one of my colleagues just said fear is a strong motivator. But I think in some way, we have to push ourselves to have some hope, right? And to, to do what we can to um, be active and engaged, yeah. right? Um, we're not paralyzed. So um, I'd like to, I mean, I've known you for quite a long time. But I'd like you to talk a little bit about, I'm really curious about your sort of your path to thinking about the importance of, um, of public art, of graffiti, of sort of the built environment and how like art impacts it. And what was it that caught your eye and sort of inspired you to create Streets sure. Department? Sure, yeah. So, I mean, I grew up in Philly. I think most people probably know that now if you follow Streets Department. I grew up in Fishtown. So, you know, there's always been street art and graffiti. It's just been part of the landscape. It's what I grew up in. Um, Philadelphia, as many people know, has some of the most public art in the world. Uh, we also have a historic graffiti scene here uh, and a really active, really vibrant street art scene. Um, but it wasn't really till my 20s. You know, I didn't go to um, college. Uh, I took some classes at community college uh, in my early tw in my mid 20s. Um, I didn't have like a formal arts education. Um, I didn't really go to art galleries or museums, really, even. Um, and it wasn't until like my 20s when I broke my leg, I got hit by a car biking to work one day. I worked at Cappuccino Gelato, if anyone remembers that place. Um, and I was home for a few months with my parents. Um, they you know, live in the same house they've lived in in Fishtown for 30 years. Um, and I was like going through depression. And then as I came out of that is when I started going to community college. Um, and I was terrified to bike. So I would walk usually from my apartment to school to work. I was walking all the time. And by then I had a boyfriend who bought me a little $100 point and shoot camera for Christmas. And I was just taking photos all the time uh, when I was walking to school, when I was walking to work. And I just one day got the inspiration to like look through the catalog of hundreds of photos I took and sort of figure out what was grabbing my eye. Um, and most of it was street art. Um, so I kind of made the connection that this was something that's unconsciously grabbing my attention why not make it a conscious effort to explore that world and meet with artists and understand it better? Um, and that's really what Streets Department has been, especially in the early days. It was a lot of learning on my behalf, and I'm always learning, but, you know, that's how it sort of started. That's so interesting, because I know I will see things on your site, and then you sort of pique my interest, and I'll often go find it. Um, so I want to thank you. So I think that you have built in people a stronger love and connection with the city. And I think that's wonderful. And so, and then, then another question would be, how have you seen, how has the art scene changed and evolved the public art scene and graffiti, street art, since you first became engaged, like between now sure. and then? Like what's the evolution? Well, one big thing is the Instagram <laughs> and social media, um, but, so when I started the blog, it was 2011. Um, and to be clear, I focused mostly on street art. So um, there is an incredible graffiti scene here in Philadelphia. Um, and there are Instagram accounts who cover it. Um, but I, mo I focus mostly on street art um, and muralism to an extent. Um, but yeah, with the street art world in particular, um, I think Instagram and the idea that you can create a piece that would live, as all street art pieces do, really 
uh, quickly on the street, you know, have a short lifespan on the street, mm -hmm. but live indefinitely on the internet. Um, and I think I started the blog in 2011. One of the first installations I photographed that sort of went viral was a, an installation by Ishnitz, a yarn bomber here in the city of Philadelphia, who does incredible work. Um, and she yarn bombed a few seats on the L and it was a statement on her behalf um, about access to art and how art can sort of travel through neighborhoods. The installation itself only lasted a few hours, SEPTA took it down pretty quickly, but the photos from it and the stories from it ended up in Juxtapose Magazine and uh, Vice and Newsweek and all these in big sources. When Instagram came around and everyone had access to sort of social media to promote street art is when it really blew up. And uh, you started to see artists like uh, Kid Hazo create sort of viral, funny installations that whose whole purpose was to make people smile. I mean, that's literally his artist statement. Uh, and, you know, have the artwork tr uh, translate and transport mostly through social media rather than seeing it in person, because a lot of his installations are super temporary as well. Um, so I think I've seen a lot of artists take more risks over the years, um, as they've seen that, you know, they can take these big risks and more people will see it. So they get a kind of a bigger reward um, as opposed to maybe a few years ago. But yeah, um, and then I think the obvious thing too is over the last few years, there's been a ton more political street artwork, um, a ton of people using street art the same way advertisers use the public space using art to promote something. And you can use art in the public space to promote Dove Soap, or you can use art in the public space to promote voting or Medicare for all or taxing the rich, you know? Um, and that's what I like to see. Yeah, that's me too. And I think what's really interesting is that, you know, when I started out, like, you know, working for the Anti-Graffiti Network, there was such a divide between graffiti and street art was sort of evolving, right? So you had, you had graffiti, murals that were in sort of their own category, and then you had public art and people would like really look down on murals and really look down on graffiti. Hmm. And now I would like your opinion. So if you look at graffiti, street art, muralism, public art, like I think the lines are blurrier and I, well, there is definitely, there are definitely differences, but sometimes not. I mean, we've straddled all those worlds sort of, which I think is a really good thing. And I think we should continue to push that. But um, I'm just curious, I, I think the, the field as public art making is better because of that, like learning and engaging with each other and not so much like, that's right, that's wrong. This is good, this is good art, this is bad art. Like I, all that judgment was like, ah. So, and how about what, what you see? Like how it all sort of inspires and affects each yeah, other? Yeah, I mean, I think they're all certainly, you know, they all talk to each other in different ways. Um, really creating in the public space is just about sort of respecting other, other people. If, you know, someone grab, does a wall first, you know, respecting that wall. Uh, and, but what I have seen is, you know, with, and, you know, I don't know, the blogs, my blog's only been around for nine years. Um, so you have a, a sort of wider perspective of running the organization Mural Arts for 35 years. But um, what I've seen a lot of is street artists, you know, I'll have a lot of conversations with street artists who maybe they went to art school or maybe they didn't, but they tried to get the attention of gallery owners. They tried to get the attention of curators. <laughs> maybe they even applied to mural arts um, and sort of no doors were opening for them, but they would still want to create art in the public space. And they'd talk with other street artists, talk, maybe invite me to coffee and learn how to create in the public space that's, you know, um, respecting sort of the street art world that's out there. Um, but also opens the door for their, their artwork. And you see people like Hysterical Men or Simone Salib um, create street art campaigns that go sort of viral, get a lot of attention. And then all of a sudden they're having galleries open their doors to them. And they're having folks like you at mural organizations invite them in. Um, so yeah, I think that's one big way that this sort of ecosystem works really well is um, artists can sort of test, you know, street, uh, test their work in street art. And you and bigger organizations, curators can uh, look at street art as a, as a way to see if, you know, something's grabbing people's eyes or yeah. if an artist is, you know, blown up or something. No, I agree with you. But I think where you've inspired us, which I think is super important, is to have like smaller commissions and be facile. Like I've always thought mural arts is a pretty facile organization. Yeah. Like I don't want to be like a big department. We can't like move, move, move. Um, and be really open to ideas. Like lately, I've been getting a lot, the past few days, even lots of proposals from artists, like just with ideas, which is good. People should continue doing that. But I think 
um, like to the polls that yeah. we do. Uh, we did we did a great like um, we worked with graffiti artists down at Eighth and Cumberland. We um, you know I just think that that ability like risk capital almost like you are always like the door should be open to different ways of working and new artists all the yeah. time. And I think that's sort of more the way of the future for <laughs> mural arts, to be honest with you. I mean, we'll always do like the big traditional large murals, but you know, let's face it, the world has now turned around several times and money is limited, right? So how do we stretch whatever we have to be included? You, well, I want to answer this question too by Coco. It says she, or they are asking what's been my, one of my favorite she art installations at Temporary. I have a ton. Kid Hazo okay. did poop emojis on PAFA. It was uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> You usually have has on at some point. Um, and it turns the sort of paint drop, paint julep um, that's under the Klaus Oldenburg paint, um, ugh, I don't know, paintbrush thing on, on North Broad Street into a poop emoji. That was really cool. And Papa loved it. I love when these sort of bigger organizations can sort of respect the work of street artists. Another one that I really love is Ishnitz in 2012 uh, yarn bombed a bikini, a pink bikini or pink underwear on the Frank Rizzo statue um, as a statement to effectively questioning if that m monument should be there, um, if we should have conversations about it. And the, um, the interesting thing about that is actually the security guards, because that's, uh, that's public land. Uh, security guards were in the background the whole time she was installing. Uh, they let her install. They let us take photos even. They were in conversations with us almost the whole time. Um, and then as soon as we were done, they're like, you done? We're going to snip it off. And we we're like, yeah, sure, thanks. Uh, and But those photos have lasted forever. I mean, to this day, the Inquirer will use photos of that installation when talking about if that uh, statue should still be there. Um, so those are, you know, those are the ones that come quick to my mind. Yeah. And Kid Hazo did a project with our Art Ed uh, department, which was fun. And then Simone Salib is doing great work with Art Ed and, and with our stuff we're doing with the Public Health Department. So thank you for re recommending yeah. people to us. It's great. So, and I think, and talking about, um, I want to talk about the times we're in about now and what role you think art can play, you know, as it relates to this crisis. Yeah, I mean, and how to hold it. I mean, I always view like art in the public space as a reflection. I think you do too. You talk about the murals that you've created over the years as sort of the story, the history, the narrative of Philadelphia. <laughs> and I think you take the longer view because your murals will last for a long time. And I think because my focus is more on the ephemeral street art, I have more of a, you know, I like when street art can sort of react to the moment and reflect my like current emotions, my current feelings. So there's been a slew, a ton of street artists sort of reacting to the moment and creating work, uh, thanking essential workers, for example, um, work, uh, reminding people to stay home and if they can and be healthy. Um, and work questioning things like, why don't we have enough PPE for healthcare workers? Uh, Jess Paints did a, a piece near Jefferson Hospital. Uh, it's a, a stencil illustration of a nurse wearing a trash bag uh, or a doctor or nurse wearing a trash bag as a protective gear. Um, and, you know, wow. when you see it, you're like, oh, that's kind of a, an interesting image. It's maybe silly. And then you think about it harder and you're like, wow, yeah, right. They don't, they're still fighting for this crucial equipment. Um, that's right, they are. So, that's what I'm drawn to, street art that can sort of reflect sort of the moment, uh, the time, you know, and it's one of the reasons why I fight so hard against advertising in the public space. Um, I did a, I've done a few different projects protesting things like advertising on the trash cans that we have around the city. Um, I think that's yeah. um, not the best use of money. Um, because I think, you know, my background's in marketing. Before I did the streets department full time, I worked for a bunch of years in marketing. Um, and I understand, you know, there's so much power with art in the public space. It affects the way we think, feel, and behave. You know, if you see an ad a number of times, statistically speaking, you're more likely to purchase that brand in the grocery store or have good feelings about that brand, generally speaking. And that's an enormous power we, we give over to advertisers in the public space. When I think we could use the public space to, again, talk about things like civic engagement, talk about things like, you know, how about essential pay for essential workers? You know that we're talking so much about essential workers right now. So many of them make minimum wage. So many of them don't have hazard pay. So many of them don't have health care. Um, maybe we could use the public space to promote things like that rather than just pure commercialism. And I think we have to be really vigilant and relentless about it because the problems that COVID is shining a light on, I mean, these are no. new problems, right? 
And so we have to remember the power that art can have in the built environment to um, be a tool of advocacy and awareness building and education and all those things. And I think I was rich, I was sort of, I think both you sort of got me thinking about it. I remember when you did your your uh, design for the back, it was a, a hypothetical design for the PSF. 2012, building. yeah, I did that. a petition. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 2012, and I was like, wow, that's fascinating. And I want you to talk about that in a minute. But also Steve Power's love letter, right? The sort of that mixing of sign painting and graffiti and there and these messages looked initially oh that is that a sign but then it was about love and intimacy um and it was like intimacy in a public yeah. space right and how you do that and that's something i think that art can do that is so lovely and wonderful um and and exactly what you're saying that there's real power in this and i think i've also shared with you how many corporations have called us to do a mural that ends up that it's really what they want as an ad and we're like you know then do a building yeah. This is not that's not what we do, right? And if you really want to get something that gives you credit in the pub, in public space, then do a beautiful work of art and like put your logo at the corner. Yeah, I mean, not up there. I wrote an Inquirer op-ed when Five Below did a gigantic uh, ad on on Market Street. Yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. Like artists need money. Like people, we should be doing big murals. We yeah. live in the mural capital of the world. There's not a dang article about Philadelphia that in the first line, it doesn't mention our public art, you know, like this is who we are. This is who we are. So like, you know, in my, it would be, it's my opinion that we should almost ban outdoor, outdoor advertising in Philadelphia. Not only is it something that I don't think we need, it's, uh, there's all these reasons why maybe it's not the best thing for people. You know, I don't, we don't need to engage with advertising every second of every day. Um, and there are plenty of places for advertisers to spend their money. Podcasts, TV, Hulu. We don't need our public space to be filled with ads as well. That's um, right. That's right. Something to be sacred. And I, I agree with you. That. Hey, look, if you're Five Below, if you're Pico, if you're Jefferson and you have all this money you want to spend on advertising, give it to the artists, give it to mural organizations, give it to you guys, give it to whoever. Create work in the public space. Uh, don't have any say in it, maybe. You know, don't need a, a round of approval. Um, but then, you know, you'll be mentioned everywhere. You'll be mentioned in the press release. You'll be mentioned on the plaque. And I think that that should be enough for those corporate partners. But um, yeah, I know that that's, I don't know, that's my opinion. My coffee's kicking in, Jane. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I agree with you. I totally agree with you. So, you know, I think um, just getting back to what, and I love what you said about during these times. I mean, because I think what we need to remember is that art's important anyway, and it's important now more than ever. And I feel like something like the arts can be, it can sort of fade um, too easily. So we have to always just be pulling it back, pulling it back. So I know at Mural Arts, I know we're working with you on a yeah. number of projects. Um, so could you talk about your art in action series, the podcast? And could you also talk about um, what you, the project you're doing with Niall? Because I'm very excited. Yeah, about that. and to your point, like, this is such art is such an art, creation and art are such an organic part of like who we are as humans, right? Like one of the first things to pop up after people were asked to stay at home and the COVID pandemic, you know, people were starting to fear what was gonna happen was the one uh, Philly art project, which uh, encouraged Philadelphians around the city to create art for their windows. Um, and that first series was rainbows. Um, they have a different series every week, but that rainbow started to take over the whole city. You can't hardly walk a block in the city now without seeing a rainbow in someone's window. Um, so it just, it proves your point is what I'm saying that like, this is so innate in us that, that we want to see, we want our public spaces to reflect uh, us and the moment and our values and art can really do that. Um, and really smart curators and mural organizations can, can do that well. We're, yeah, as you mentioned, we're working on a few things. What I'm doing right now is my podcast is still going on. I'm having conversations Yay. with, um, different folks from around the city and around the country. Our last guest was Robert Perry from Tattooed Mom, so I know you know, is a big supporter of art in the public space, a huge supporter of the street art scene, and just an incredible person. Um, we talked about in the podcast, um, his struggles as a small business owner. Um, as of you know, last week, he had no support from the city, state, or federal level, um, going on six weeks uh, of no support after his business had to shift, uh, close down, except for takeout service. So we talk about that. But we also just talk about the history of moms, uh, the history of South Street, and him growing up in Hawaii. So check that out if you've never seen my podcast, Street Step Podcast. Um, and then we, are we saying this, are working on a podcast together. 
I pitched Mural Arts. Um, I really like producing podcasts. Anyone who's listened to my podcast probably knows that I love it. Um, so yeah, I pitched you on the idea of like, hey, why, there's so many stories Mural Arts has to tell, and you do a great job telling it through your website and your email and your press releases and all that kind of stuff. But podcasting is one area you, you haven't uh, taken advantage of yet. Um, and it's gr such a great platform for storytelling, long form storytelling. And you have some stories to tell. Um, Mural Arts has some stories to tell. Um, the city of Philadelphia has some stories to tell. So um, over the next, uh, I think our, we'll be launching in a few weeks, but over a 10 episode uh, series, we'll be telling 10 of your stories. Um, I'm really excited about that. I'm like so excited. And then um, that is Really. And another thing we're working and, on and is then, Niall Livingston, who I see in the comments there. Um, and yeah, I yeah, and you hi. are working on um, a temporary monument to essential workers in this time. Um, we're talking with a few folks about where that location might be, but um, I just had a call yesterday with a, with a, a potential wall. So um, that's moving along. Yeah, there's so much going on. I mean, you said it when you were, and in addition to all that, I'm doing daily live interview chats. So like this, but with, you know, other folks. Yesterday we had Rick Kajewski, who's running for PA state rep. Uh, today we have um, DJ uh, Robert Drake from WXPN. Um, and you are a third guest and in it. You said that this is, you know, artists are so agile. Artists are so caring and empathetic. And artists are going to react to this moment very quickly. And I think you've been proven right by that. Every day, artists are on Instagram, on Instagram Live, on Facebook, on Zoom, just producing and creating and sharing and empathizing. And it's been really, you know, in this incredibly tough time for so many, it's been really um, enlightening to, inspiring to watch. And, you know, we're doing, we're partnering with the Department of Public Health. We've been working with Broad Street Ministry. We've been working with Prevention Point. And we're doing decals and vinyls. Oh my God, Jane. We pay some posters. Niall, you and I, we, and Broad Street Ministry, we did the murals to the hand washing station. That seems like 300 years That's ago. Right, That's right, the hand washing cool. station. We're doing two more. And, and we're doing two more. We're doing two more. And thank you and thank Ginger, Conrad. Ginger you, Rudolph, yeah. You both really stepped up too. So there's just been an outpouring of support from the artist community about how they can help and give back and make a difference. And, you know, I think it's really important that people have access to public health messages that are accurate, that are trustworthy, and that are translated into many languages. And that's what we're doing right now all over the city. And we're about to embark on a project with the Center City District to do something beautiful on the boarded up, on the places that are boarded up, the shops. So, I mean, we, we want and we deserve and we need beauty in our environment. And I'm always just thankful, Conrad, that you have a, a relentlessness to you about how to so get, you know, both produce work and support the work that's going on everywhere. I, I just think that is incredibly important. And the other thing, oh, I don't know if you know this, but, but the women who are affiliated with Southeast by Southeast are making masks, beautiful masks. And the woman who's running the, that sort of the, the cohort making masks was on Project Runway. So they're actually quite oh, whoa. lovely masks as well. And I think I'll- <laughs> So we're trying to figure out ways to be useful and valuable and, um, I just think that's and so another cool. series you're hosting is, oh, I'm forgetting the title of it, but it's going to be like a Zoom uh, interview thing. But I'm hosting one on June, is, uh, in early June with uh, Shia Walensky, Southeast by Southeast, and a few of the artists who are participating. It's another thing we should shout out. But you'll, I'm, you know, if you're following either of us, you'll hear more about that. Yeah, where it's part of our art, art in action series. Yeah. And that is where we have really interesting speakers. We're going to have a really interesting um, group talking about our reimagining re reentry program, uh, where we have a fellowship program for artists who've been incarcerated, and um, then we have a reentry program called the Guild. So that'll be interesting. And we're going to be talking about how do you, how do you do community work and and with what's going on right now. And then your your um, conversation will be really interesting. We're trying to pick issues that are really relevant and have interesting conversations with different constituents that um, our lives touch. So um, how do we sort of, I don't know. I think for us, it's like, how do we just be value added and helpful in any way? Um, and, and so in speaking about like, I think when I think about the future of the city, Conrad, I think I think about you and a lot of uh, younger artists out there who I just give me a sense of hopefulness about Philadelphia. So I'm really interested in sort of what you would, if you were in conversation with, um, with, when you're in conversation with politicians or policymakers, like what, what's your vision and what would you like to see the city doing more of? Like what can we, when we think of the next two years, three years, six years, 10 years, like what's your 
So maybe your like your vision. Wow, that's a big question, but yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, you know, my politics is that I feel like this the whole system is lopsided for the very few at the top. Um, and that generally speaking, we need kind of fundamental shifts in how we um, redistribute sort of uh, those resources, because ultimately, even the few at the top can't prosper if the working class, you know, poor folks, um, people in neighborhoods across the country can't sustain themselves. So, I, you know, I'm always when I have politicians on asking about healthcare, and healthcare should be a human right. Uh, we live in a country that has plenty of resources and I think could easily fund um, a, a mm -hmm. single payer system the way that every other country for the most part does. Um, and, you know, I think uh, paid, I think what you mentioned earlier about COVID sort of opening up, uh, putting a magnifying glasses on a lot of these issues is so true. You know, hazard pay should be uh, what everyone who's working right now uh, out in the world should be receiving. We need to raise the minimum wage. Um, and yeah, I do often ask, you know, they're about public space you know how do you value the public space because it is ours collectively uh, and it's been sold parts of it have been sold off or rented um, we have a lot of public parks in the city now that are rented to um, private organizations that run them and that was a deal that we struck in the 90s when Philadelphia was um, pretty cash poor and it looked like a good idea and it has worked to an extent but what are the long-term consequences of doing that um, I petitioned against building a Starbucks in Dilworth Park uh, last year. And that was in large part because I saw it as a sign of like what they could do if, you know, yes, the Starbucks was small. Yes, there are bigger things to fight about and to worry about in the city. But, you know, if that Starbucks is seen as successful by the, by the people who are renting it to Starbucks, maybe they chop up more of our public parks. And, you know, public space is one of the few things that we have collectively that's, that's all of ours. And, um, I just hate to see it chipped away like that. Um, but so, yeah, I'm kind of on a tangent now, but I think the my politics are generally we need to redistribute some stuff because we have it. We have the wealth and the access and the and the money and the things to redistribute. It's just all at the top. It's all just pulled at the top. Um, and it's not fair. Um, it's not going to not good it's for not anyone. Fair. That's right. And what you're discussing is a city that is more humane and more equitable. And I think that we need to be constantly sort of on point with that. And I think as um, as public space gets ceded increasingly to private interests, we need to put our stake in the ground and say that this is ours collectively. And, in and I think that every time an artist is working in public space, I feel like a surge of energy and excitement because I feel like that's what's happening. Yeah. And in talking with like local politicians, like at the city level, there's only so much they can do really. So it's about like energizing people to, you know, so many of the projects I've worked on since 2013, 2014 have been around voting because I believe in the power of the democratic system. And if we just get the right people in the right positions in power, we can make big change. And I think we've seen that with people like Larry Krasner, who you're working with this year with your restorative justice program. Yes. Um, you know, one position that's one elected official, the DA, um, who can make big changes. Now look at the state reps. Who's your state rep? Who's your city council person? Uh, these people are making gigantic decisions about the way we live every single day. I think a lot of people get really obsessed about who the president's gonna be. And, you know, it's certainly worth caring about who the president's going to be. Um, but all these other positions are just as important, if not more, about how we live. Um, you know, I'm talking a lot with my daily lives with people running for state senate, state, state house. And they're talking about things like, mm -hmm. okay, maybe Medicare for all won't happen at the national level because even the Democrat running doesn't seem to be for it. But we can enact a Medicare for all in PA. I didn't know we could do that. Um, and so, you know, we could, you know, if you have these big ideas about which way the country should go, you can vote on the state level, the city level, and, and get those things um, or parts of those things enacted. Um, it doesn't always have to be just who's going to be president. Um, so that's something I've learned with the daily yeah, lives. That's right. And then could you talk about to the polls, what you did and what we're, you're aspiring to do with us this fall? Because I can't think of anything with the, the issue around voting is more important. Yeah, we're working a lot together this year. Thank you for that. Um, I know. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm like, like, you I'm years crazy. ago. I don't know if I should say this. Whatever. All right, whatever. You, you know, I started my blog in 2011 and you were one of the first sort of like big city leaders to really reach out to me and just like try to get in my head. We got coffee, we chatted. You were like trying to see where I was coming from. And I was, you know, asking you questions. We had a great lunch. It was like years and years and years ago. 
Um, and ever since then, you've engaged me. You've asked me to, you've asked my thoughts on different projects. You've asked me to give advice for different things. Um, and years ago, yeah, we were like at coffee or something. You're like, if you have an idea and you can't fund it, come to me and I, I might be able to help you. And um, that's what I did with To The Polls. In 2018, I felt this in, in, in 2018, I felt this in, in banana sense of urgency around that election, um, as everyone did. Um, and just a few months before the election, I emailed you and you said, come in and we had a meeting and I said, I have this idea for um, a, a public arts project sort of thing, temporary thing where we'd ask 10 artists to create 10 temporary murals that would talk about civic engagement and voting and why they vote and why voting is important to them. Um, you helped me find the budget for that. And then we pulled together to the polls in 2018 um, and it did really well. Um, we did it inside. We did it in a, in a space just cause that's, what we were looking at that year. But uh, for this coming election and for the elections this year, we're talking about bringing to the polls back. So we're looking at an October launch. We're looking at outdoor locations. We're having a very good conversation with Love Park right now. They seem interested. Um, I think given COVID too, and the fact that we're probably gonna have to social dis distance for a while, um, I think doing it in the public space makes even more sense. Um, but yeah, bringing in more artists, bigger murals yeah. and using, you know, as I've said a few times on this, art in the public space is so powerful, Instagram is so powerful, and we can use art, the public space, and Instagram to promote civic engagement. You know, plenty of brands do it, right? How many in influencers do you follow that, you know, show you the vitamins they're taking or the, the shampoo that they're using? Uh, we can use all of these tools at our disposal to promote civic engagement, and um, I'm excited about that. To the polls 2020. Yes. So we are now out of time, but I just want to say um, that we have- I can talk. Mono. Have you and, noticed? Uh, it's Art Ignites Change. Oh, no, we love hearing you talk. Are you kidding? It's so great. But it's art about art igniting change. And the change happens in people and in place. By extension, there are changes throughout our city. We're in a city that is really like an outdoor museum. But I hope, and I hope so much all of you believe this, that this collection belongs to all of you. And Conrad, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for inspiring me personally inspiring mural arts, keeping us on point, and reminding us about the power of art every day. So Jane, thank you. Jane, thank you're you. one of the most important people in the whole city, and I'm so glad we've met, and we've worked together, and we continue to work together. And yeah, you inspire me every single day. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, Bye, bye. And tune in next Wednesday. All right. Bye. Bye.